Welcome to a broadcast of the Democratic Alliance. Did you know the DA is the second biggest party in South Africa, making the DA the official opposition in Parliament? The DA is the only opposition party to govern a province, the award-winning, best-run Western Cape. The best-run municipalities in South Africa are all governed by the DA. DA mayors are working hard to protect residents from national government failures. By getting the basics right, delivering better services and having zero tolerance for corruption. This is the DA Difference. The next broadcast will start shortly. Follow us on social media for the latest in news and politics in South Africa. Like and follow our page on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on anything. Be part of the conversation. Tell us what you think in the comment section and please like and share our videos with your friends and family. The next broadcast will start shortly. If you care about South Africa and want to make a positive difference, then join the DA. Visit our website at w.da.org.za for more information. Find out who represents you in your ward and district. Who are the DA mayors working for you in your town or city? And which MPs represent you and your causes in Parliament? On our website, you can learn more about our latest campaigns and how you can get involved. Join the fight to save South Africa. Become an activist. Become a councillor. Become a member of Parliament. If you want to make South Africa a better place, please visit donate.da.org.za. Donate to a cause you believe in. Did you know the DA is the second biggest party in South Africa, making the DA the official opposition in Parliament? The DA is the only opposition party to govern a province, the award-winning, best-run Western Cape. The best-run municipalities in South Africa are all governed by the DA. DA mayors are working hard to protect residents from national government failures. By getting the basics right, delivering better services and having zero tolerance for corruption. This is the DA Difference. The next broadcast will start shortly. Follow us on social media for the latest in news and politics in South Africa. Like and follow our page on Facebook. Follow us on Instagram and Twitter. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit that notification bell so that you don't miss out on anything. Be part of the conversation. Tell us what you think in the comment section and please like and share our videos with your friends and family. The next broadcast will start shortly. If you care about South Africa and want to make a positive difference, then join the DA. Visit our website at w.da.org.za for more information. Find out who represents you in your ward and district. Who are the DA mayors working for you in your town or city? And which MPs represent you and your causes in Parliament? On our website, you can learn more about our latest campaigns and how you can get involved. Join the fight to save South Africa. Become an activist. Become a councillor. Become a member of Parliament. If you want to make South Africa a better place, please visit donate.da.org.za. Donate to a cause you believe in. Donate to make a difference. Join the DA, because the DA gets things done. In this election, only the registered have the power. If you're tired of load shedding, register to vote. If you're tired of corruption, register to vote. If you're tired of the rising cost of living, register to vote. And if you're tired of a government that's continuously working against you, register to vote. Go to check.da.org.za and let's give power to the register.
morning. Colleagues, a very good morning to all of you and thank you so much for attending our press briefing today titled The DA Introduces Scorpions 2.0 to Tackle State Capture 2.0. May we also welcome our technical crew that's bringing us this live stream all the way from Cape Town. My name is Charity McCourt. I'm the media spokesperson for the DA Federal Leader. John Stianazen. Just a quick round of introductions for those who have not yet met the leadership. On my immediate right, we have the federal leader, John Stianazen, and right next to him, we have Dr. Leon Schreiber, who is our DA Shadow Minister for Public Service and Administration. On my left, we have our DA Chief Whip in Parliament, Sivue Hwahube. And right next to her is Mr. Werner Horn, and he's our dear Shadow Minister for Justice and Correctional Services. In addition to that, he's also our national spokesperson, together with Soli Malazzi. I will be handing over to the federal leader to address you. And once all the leadership have made input, I will come back to open for a round or two of questions. Just one house rule before I hand over to the leader, if you could please ensure that all our phones are on silent. Thank you, colleagues. Over to you, John. Thank you very much, Charity, and thank you very much to the members of the media that are here today and also to all of you who are watching the live stream. The 22nd of June 2023 marked exactly one year since the final report of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector was released by Chief Justice Raymond Zondo. In the years since the report's release, uh, in an exercise that cost the South African taxpayer in excess of one billion rand, the process to implement the raft of recommendations made in the Zondo Commission reports and the structural changes to South Africa's state institutions and oversight bodies has sadly come to a grinding halt. Of the 98 ANC members mentioned in the Zondo Commission report, not one has been reprimanded by the party or handed over to law enforcement for investigation. In the National Assembly, of the 16 recommendations, made by the Zondo report to bolster and fix Parliament's model of accountability and oversight of the executive, the majority of the substantive and immediately implementable recommendations have already been voted down by the ANC using the tyranny of their majority in the committee. In a briefing to Parliament's Select Committee on Security and Justice on its annual performance plan earlier this year, the National Director of Public Prosecutions, Shamila Batoy, and officials from the National Prosecuting Authority said that the institution does not have the skills or the legal powers to adequately probe state capture. This is also evidenced by the fact that the first case against state capture failed so spectacularly. To add insult to injury, there still exists in South Africa no truly independent anti-corruption busting body similar to the Scorpions, which the ANC disbanded many, many years ago uh, as it started to intrude and bring its cases closer to those in executive office. We know that life for majority of South Africans has got decidedly worse under President Sul Ramaphosa a man who has merely extended the nine wasted years into 14 and whose image as a corruption buster and a reformer has been completely blown by the Palapala scandal and the other failures mm. of leadership. But it is the revelations of blatant ANC corruption that continue unabated in the face of this absolute impunity since the release of the Zonda report 
that is a cause of greater concern to the Democratic Alliance and millions of South Africans. In the wake of the ANC's 55th National Congress in December last year, several party ministers and members were implicated in the Zondo report. People who should be investigated and prosecuted were instead rewarded with positions of authority within the party's highest ranks. The Zondo Commission, for instance, found that there was enough evidence for former Water and Sanitation Minister Nomvulo Mokonyane to be investigated and prosecuted for corruption for receiving bribes from Busasa. She now serves as the ANC's first Deputy Secretary General. Former Transport Minister Fakil Mbalula has been found to have used 3 million rand from national grant money to purchase a luxury property in Johannesburg. He now serves as the ANC's Secretary General. Former ANC Treasurer General Paul Mashatile lives a life of lavish luxury, clearly funded by the state capture corruption accused Edwin Sodi. He currently serves as Deputy President both of the ANC and the Republic of South Africa with a very, very keen eye, as we've seen in recent weeks, on the presidency itself. But it goes further than that. Royal Security, a Zondo-accused company, along with many others implicated in the Zondo Commission report, are yet to be blacklisted and barred from bidding for government tenders. These companies have faced no consequence whatsoever for aiding and abetting the looting of public money and billions of rands of taxpayer funds and make it virtually impossible for tender bidding processes to be adequately vetted by the state to ensure greater transparency and accountability. But perhaps the most glaring example of the ANC's abject failure to get to grips and implement the Zondo Commission's reports is the chief architect of state capture himself, Jacob Zuma, who has evaded his initial prison sentence for contempt of court due to the illegal granting of medical parole by none other than state capture accused and the former head of correctional services, Arthur Fraser. So from the very top down, the ANC has done nothing to act against those who have been brought about as being held responsible or should be held responsible for some of the darkest periods in South Africa's post-apartheid history and for the fact that they have robbed the opportunity of millions of South Africans in order to line their own pockets and those of their associates. So what South Africans are witnessing now is not an age of accountability or a new dawn, as was promised by the president when he made his first speech as president in 2019. What we are witnessing is a second coming of rampant corruption and unabated ANC looting. We are witnessing before our very eyes state capture 2.0. The Democratic Alliance is the nation's official opposition has taken several steps to ensure that accountability is strengthened, that institutions are rebuilt and bolstered independently and impartially, and that organs of state tasked with the investigation responsibility and the prosecution of those implicated in the corruption is strengthened. And we're going to take you through some of those today. One of the first steps that we've done is written to the chairperson of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council, Professor Feroz Kachalia, to highlight a number of concerns we have with the Council's work, which has taken place in a total vacuum of transparency and accountability, where only the executive has sight of the work of the Council, its proposals, and not the necessary independent institutions like Parliament that should be going through those reports and enacting those recommendations. And this should be of particular concern to all South Africans, given that we cannot trust the NCACC's impartiality and credibility if it is proposing its very solutions and suggestions to a problem of corruption with the very source of the corruption problem itself. This despite an initial assurance from the President in his 2021 State of the Nation address that the NACAC would report to Parliament and not the executive. 
Given that the NAC AC is housed within the presidency itself and compounded by the fact that the chairperson, Professor Feroz Kachalia, is himself a former ANC public office bearer, this begs the serious question, who watches the watchers? And how independent is the NAC AC actually? And we believe this presents a grave conflict of interest, given that President Ramaphosa himself and Deputy President Paul Mashatili are facing several allegations of corruption and misconduct in the light of the Palapala scandal and close financial ties to state capture accused Edwin Sodi, respectively. One of the main recommendations emanating from Justice Zondo's report was the urgent task of firewalling our institutions, such as Parliament and the National Prosecuting Authority, from undue political influence. This would include ensuring that oversight over the executive included the combating of corrupt activities committed by the members of the executive themselves must be carried out by independent, impartial and respected bodies tasked with that responsibility, such as Parliament. It is for this reason that we have highlighted these concerns with Professor Kachalia and made a number of requests to the NACAC, which include the following. First, we seek a comprehensive summary of the work undertaken by the NACAC over the past 10 months, including any and all proposals made to the presidency, especially those relating to the implementation of a wide range of recommendations outlined in the Zondo report. Secondly, the NACAC's commitment to table its proposals in the National Assembly, where members of parliament those entrusted by the voters with exercising the oversight function can consider and deliberate on the proposed creation of new corruption fighting bodies. This should include a record of correspondence with both the Speaker of the National Assembly and the chairpersons of the relevant committees. Thirdly, the NACAC's plan to fully capacitate and equip the National Prosecuting Authority to independently investigate any and all individuals named in the Zondo report without fear or favour, especially those with close ties to the President, the Deputy President and members of the current National Executive. Fourthly, we want to see the NACAC's plan to investigate and prosecute private sector individuals identified in the Zondo report including the blacklisting of respective companies and their boards. We provided the NACAC with a two-week period to furnish us with its response, the deadline of which is the 18th of July. We look greatly forward to engaging with the Council and welcome its proposals to Parliament, where the work of accountability over the Executive rightly belongs. There should be no problem with this work being tabled in Parliament, because that is precisely what the President promised in 2021. He said they will be responsible to Parliament and not to the Executive. However, to date, it seems it is only the Executive that has had any input or assistance or advice from the NACAC. In terms of the Acting Public Protector Aleka's report on allegations of misconduct, Relating to the theft at President Sul Ramaphosa's private Palapala farm, we are still in consultation with our legal team and will be pursuing any potential avenues for an appeal or review. Again, this matter is horribly compounded by the fact that this individual is herself an applicant for the position of public protector, which obviously brings into question the impartiality. I'm now going to hand over to Vanna Horn, who will take us through some of the further proposals. Thank you, John. Good morning, everyone from my side. I think the first uh, backdrop to, to what we are to announce is, is uh, I believe, the common understanding in South Africa now that the fight against... Back in 2019, when President Ramaphosa took office, he, of course, 
uh, made bold promises around tackling corruption, rooting it out, and ultimately uh, bringing us to a new dawn. However, the enthusiasm was short-lived and no firm action uh, really has been taken uh, to ultimately deal with corruption effectively. In 2021, during his State of a Nation address, he announced the establishment of, of the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council and importantly for our announcements today, made it explicit that one of the key tasks of the NACC would be the establishment of a truly independent statutory anti-corruption body that reports to Parliament. So two and a half years later, there's still no sign of this body. It would seem that in the meantime, if one <coughs> follows both the President and the Minister of Justice's uh, comments around the matter, that this promise was now replaced with a new promise, and that's to make the investigative director in the NPA a permanent structure, which of course also remains an unkept promise in as far as it's only talked about at this stage. Now, as the Democratic Alliance, we, we stand firmly allied with those in society who for long have advocated that what we need is a truly independent anti-corruption entity. We believe that to fortify such an uh, anti-corruption entity from political manipulation, whether it's manipulation by this government or a future government, even made up by political parties now not part of government, we strongly believe that this body must be set up on the basis of establishing a new Chapter 9 institution. Because this will be the only way in we, which we can prevent future politicians from disbanding such a body like was done with the Scorpions when their investigations start getting hitting too close to home. If this entity, furthermore, is, is positioned as a Chapter 9, which through the amendment of the Constitution is already identified as an entity critical to the maintenance of the rule of law in this country, we believe that that would mean that for such a body to be disbanded or abolished in future, 75% of members of parliament will need to support it. So that would position such a body to be operating in a truly independent space uh, in an optimal manner. Of course, the Glenister judgment that was abused to ultimately abolish the Scorpions identified certain key characteristics of a truly independent anti-corruption or anti-crime uh, 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 entity. Firstly, that it must be specialized. Secondly, that it must be properly trained and staffed through a professional component. And lastly, and very importantly, that uh, the uh, staff component must enjoy security of tenure. Uh, it's quite clear that even if some tinkering happens around the NPA and the investigative directorate, that there's no guarantee that the investigative directorate will meet these requirements as set out in the Glen Glenister judgment. Furthermore, of course, the act that informs the, uh, regulates the NPA can always be amended with a simple majority in Parliament. So we have, as John has indicated, written to the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council to ask where they, what progress, if any, they have made with the establishment of this entity. But at the same time, because we know uh, that not much possibly has happened given the way in which this government deals with strengthening the institutions that must assist this country in the fight against corruption. We have also worked to draft private members' bills to amend both the constitution and to establish such an uh, anti-corruption commission. And give, uh, depending on the answer we will receive, we're ready to table that in parliament. At the same time, we of course live in a time where uh, whistleblowers and the role they play will be a key component of any successful fight against specifically corruption and organized mafia state-like crime. And in that sense, we 
of the view that urgency and specific interventions now needs to be shown regarding the plight of whistleblowers in South Africa. In, in, in his State of the Nation address in 2020, President Ramaphosa said that law enforcement agencies will deal with the immediate concern around the safety of whistleblowers, but yet we only saw last week ultimately that a discussion document was now published by the Department of Justice um, inviting comments on some proposals to amend the whistleblower regime in our country. Uh, the choice to publish such a document rather than a draft bill one and a half years later is in our view indicative of the way in which this government talks about uh, the fight against corruption and assisting whistleblowers rather than really embarking on firm steps. We're not saying all of the draft proposals in the discussion document is bad. Some of them are well thought out, but we also have identified one key component of making sure that whistleblowers uh, come to the fore in this country and are properly protected, which is lacking from the discussion document, and that is uh, the establishment and the operation of a compensation fund for whistleblowers who come to the fore and ultimate, uh, ultimately assist this country to recoup money and to ensure that those at the top of mafia state-like operations ultimately are jailed. We strongly believe that organi the organized manner in which grant corruption is now being perpetrated demands bold, decisive and urgent action. And once again, we will be looking in the very near future to introduce a private member's bill to achieve this if the government of the day remains unwilling to incorporate a compensation fund to th in this draft bill that will follow from the discussion document. Thank you. I will now hand over to, I believe, Subiwe. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Werner. Uh, colleagues, I think it's important to note why it is that we are lamenting the lack of progress from our government institutions and from parliament in terms of insulating government from essentially state capture 2.0. We spent years with the State Capture Commission doing its work and over a billion rand was spent doing this work. And in fact, recently, Chief Justice Raymond Zondo has expressed concern that if State Capture 2.0 were to happen, Parliament would not be in a position to prevent it. And while Parliament and the presiding officers were very quick to you know, deny this, it is in our view that he's absolutely correct that if State Capture 2.0 were to happen tomorrow, a parliament, in fact, would uh, aid and abet it as it had done uh, in the previous round. A year after the report has been tabled, and the reason being, the reason why we are saying this is because a year after the report has been tabled in parliament, there have been no substantive changes that have been made, other legislative changes or rules to the, to the National Assembly uh, rules. In fact, the ANC has almost taken a hostile position towards the report. Uh, a number of uh, senior ANC members have essentially started saying that the recommendations of the Zondo Commission report are, in fact, judicial overreach. Um, there has been a hostility with which the ANC in Parliament is treating their recommendations, almost suggesting that these recommendations can be ignored. And it is our view that a billion rand later and three years later, we cannot simply ignore these recommendations that have been made, particularly when we look at South Africans are looking at members of parliament to correct how parliament has dealt with corruption in the past. We know over 30 million South Africans are living in poverty and an almost 70 percent youth unemployment rate. And these things and these statistics do not exist in isolation, but they exist because our government is incapable of using public money for what it is meant for. The State Capture Commission made 16 recommendations to Parliament to strengthen its oversight role. Some of them were legislative amendments and some of them were, were changes to the rules of the National Assembly and the National Council of Provinces. And yet all of these have been, and none of these have actually been implemented. 
And what is perhaps not known is that a number of these recommendations have already been voted down by the ANC in the Rules Committee. And I hasten to highlight that it is the ANC that has voted these recommendations down because it is them who hold the majority in these committees, such as the Rules Committee. And some of these include, one, there was a recommendation by the Commission to increase opposition chairs in committees so that committees can better do their work so that we can have stronger oversight over the executive. That recommendation was, without even much debate, voted down by the ANC. Number one, number two, the DA also asked to reintroduce interpolations in the National Assembly, which essentially are a question and answer session in Parliament, which allows for a deeper uh, um, back and forth and allows for a greater interrogation of a particular issue with a minister. This was also voted down by the ANC in the Rules Committee. The DA and other opposition parties have for years now, number three, have now for years called for a portfolio committee that would oversee the presidency. This is, could not be more important now considering that there are several uh, members of the executive which now sit within the presidency, yet the presidency still sits without a portfolio committee. And this was a matter of great discussion in the Rules Committee and in effect, um, the chair of the Rules Committee, which is the Speaker of the National Assembly, Nosivio Mapisa Ngakula, and her team have now deemed it necessary for the Rules Committee to do, to undertake uh, rather a study tour instead of implementing this recommendation, which we believe is international best practice. And to showcase that, in our view, State Capture 2.0 is not very far off, we have seen some key important decisions that the ANC in Parliament has done or has taken, and these are important to note. Last year, when the Section 89 process to investigate the president and the president's role in the Pala Pala scandal was initiated in Parliament, and the Section 89 independent panel tabled its report in Parliament, the ANC caucus in Parliament decided to vote against that report, essentially halting the process of investigating the president. Again, if you cast your eye back to several years ago, this would be the same thing that the ANC had done during the Nkandla scandal. So it is not only fair to say that there have been no lessons learned, but we can see a repeat of what has happened in Parliament before. And number two, we've also seen the part... Um, the DA had, uh, since the appointment of the electricity minister, we had called for an ad hoc committee that would oversee the work of the of the of this minister, particularly considering that the energy crisis is one of the biggest crises in South Africa at the moment. This too was voted down by the ANC. And so, while the DA has a long history of of really pushing for parliament and uh, and and parliamentary reform. We're not going to stop doing so. However, we're of the view that it is a working parliament is not in the interest of the ANC. And they're going to do everything in their power to not only hollow out essentially the capacity in parliament to do its work, but effectively they're going to block every single attempt to make parliament a stronger institution that can stop corruption in its tracks. And of course, an organization that has corrupt individuals within its own ranks is not going to be um, enthusiastic about having an institution that works. But we're of the view that uh, um, potentially next year we will be able to change the composition of parliament and that the ANC will not enjoy the numbers that they do. And that if that is the case, we will make sure that these some of these parliamentary reforms are implemented. Thank you. Thanks very much, Chief Whip, and good morning to everyone. I will be addressing a specific aspect of state capture, which is, of course, ANC cater deployment, which is something that continues unabated to this day. The DA continues to lead the fight against cater deployment because it forms the very basis of state capture and corruption. This is because the ANC uses cater deployment 
to subvert formal appointment processes in order to ensure that pliant and loyal cadres are appointed to positions of power. In every single case of capture, whether it is under President Zuma, under the current president, the most fundamental question that needs to be asked every time is how were the persons in power appointed in the first place? We know from the cadre deployment minutes covering the period between 2018 and 2021, which the DA managed to expose, that the ANC's deployment committee directly interferes in appointments across government departments, provinces, municipalities, state-owned enterprises, and in some cases, even in the courts. The emergence of State Capture 2.0 under the Ramaphosa presidency is following exactly the same pattern as before. And as we did before, let's connect the dots. Individuals like Edwin Sodi and Philemon Letwaba fund the luxury lifestyles of the likes of Fikile Mbalula and Paul Mashatile for a very good reason. It is because they know that senior ANC politicians hold sway over appointment and procurement decisions. There would frankly be no point to funding the luxury lifestyles of these ANC politicians if they did not have the power to ensure that corrupt people are appointed into those positions and that they will do the bidding of the likes of Saudi. This is how cadre deployment works. Those who wish to capture the state influence ANC politicians to ensure that pliant individuals are appointed who will assist with doling up out corrupt tenders and other benefits, as we've seen in the case of the lotto, to friends of the politicians. And in turn, they funnel a slice of this largesse back to the Mbalulas and Mashatiles of this world. The way to stop and interrupt this cycle is by taking away the power that ANC politicians hold over the appointment and subsequent procurement processes. We need to firewall all public appointments against political interference and replace cadre deployment with merit-based appointments. The Zondo Commission agrees with this assessment. This is not only the DA saying this. And I quote from the Zondo report, the evidence has demonstrated that state capture has been facilitated by the appointment of pliant individuals to powerful positions in state entities, end quote. The DA has repeatedly warned that state capture will continue unabated for as long as cadre deployment continues. Strikingly, the same warning was echoed almost word for word by the Zondo Commission. Quote, the essential danger remains that appointment processes which are conducted behind closed doors and outside of the constitutionally and legally stipulated processes are open to abuse. End quote. This warning, both from the DA and from the State Capture Commission, is now becoming true before our very eyes. And the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council itself has questions to answer. The ANC's Cater Deployment Committee minutes show that on the 26th of June 2020, the President appeared before the committee, and the minutes note the following. The President started by apologizing for the appointment of the SOE Council, without the involvement of the deployment committee, explaining that it was an omission due to pressure, end quote. It is therefore very likely that the delay in appointing the National Anti-Corruption Advisory Council two years after this meeting took place was because the president first had to get permission from the ANC's deployment committee to decide who would be appointed to this council. Given that the current chair of this committee was a senior ANC office bearer until 2010, this begs the question, is the head of the Anti-Corruption Commission himself a deployed cadre, placed into that position to protect the interests of the ANC? If so, it would explain the council's, frankly, failure to do anything to prevent State Capture 2.0. The DA will be asking detailed questions in this regard in Parliament. Another obvious example in recent times of how cadre deployment continues to lay the foundation for capture and corruption comes from the institution designed specifically to ensure a skilled and politically independent public service, namely the Public Service Commission. Just last month, the ANC rammed through Parliament the recommendation to appoint someone called Errol Magerman as a PSC commissioner. The law clearly requires all PSC commissioners to be, quote, independent and impartial. But guess what? 
The ANC recommended Magerman even though he is currently a sitting member of the provincial legislature in Gauteng for the African National Congress. Does that sound like impartial and independent to you? The only reason the ANC does this is because they know that cadres like Magerman will serve the party rather than the people when they assume positions of power. In the case of the PSC, this is obviously to ensure that no firm action is taken to disrupt patronage networks where the PSC investigates. So this begs the question, why, do this, why does this keep happening? The answer to that is because the Zondo Commission's finding about CADA deployment has been ignored. The Commission made it clear, and I quote again, that it is unlawful and unconstitutional for a president of this country and any minister, deputy minister or director general or any other government official, including those in parastatals, to take into account recommendations of the ANC Deployment Committee. Unconstitutional and illegal and yet it continues to this moment. In fact, President Cyril Ramaphosa openly rejected this finding, saying in court papers filed in response to the DA's challenge to confirm that cater deployment is unconstitutional, that the finding is, quote, not binding on him or his government. When the DA introduced the end cater deployment bill in Parliament, which would have made it a crime to interfere in appointment processes, the ANC, like the Chief Whip said on so many other occasions, voted it down because, sadly, for now, they hold a majority. This is why the DA's court challenge against cater deployment has now become critically important. The ANC has made it abundantly, abundantly clear that it will continue with the illegal practice of cater deployment in open defiance of the Zondo report. The DA will continue to fight tooth and nail to stop them. We have already won two rounds of our court battle to obtain and expose complete ANC deployment records dating back to January 2013 when Ramaphosa became the CADA chairman. The ANC lost in the High Court, their leave to appeal was rejected with costs and they have now run to the Supreme Court of Appeal, where we anticipate their petition will soon be rejected once more. Sooner or later, the DA is going to force the ANC to hand over those records which will explain why Ramaphosa refused to implement the Zondo findings on cater deployment. It's critical to understand why he is defying Zondo on this. This is because as the cater deployment chairman at the time, Ramaphosa was deeply and personally implicated in state capture 1.0. He was the person who pliantly deployed the people who captured the state on behalf of Zuma and the Guptas. The scale of Ramaphosa's dishonesty over cater deployment is striking. When he appeared before the Zondo Commission, the president conceded that it is inappropriate for the activities of the deployment committee to be done in dark corners and that there must be transparency. That's what he said to Judge Zondo. But when the DA tried to enforce this commitment to transparency through a promotion of access to Information Act request, Ramaphosa opposed it. Given his dishonorable track record and personal complicity, it should come as no surprise that Ramaphosa defends this corrupt system, that he is intent on hiding the truth about his involvement in CADA deployment and that he is doing nothing now that State Capture 2.0 has rolled around. And so it falls to the DA to abolish CADA deployment. That is exactly what we are going to do, not only through our court case, but also when the ANC loses its majority next year right at the top of our list of priorities in a new government will be fundamental legislative and regulatory reform to remove politics from public sector appointments and replace cater deployment with merit-based appointment. State capture cannot exist without some form of cater deployment. If we had a merit-based appointment system that was insulated from politics and we only skilled professionals were appointed, there would be no point in bribing ANC politicians because these politicians would not have the power to interfere. The DA's case to enforce the unconstitutionality of cater deployment is a vital part of the effort to enforce the findings of the Zondo Commission. It is in the interest of every South African that we succeed so that we can stop state capture 2.0 dead in its tracks. Thank you.
thank you so much to our leadership for that insightful briefing. Colleagues, we now open for a few questions. Standard practice applies. Please introduce the media house that you're representing, your names, and perhaps direct the question to any of our leaders. Any hands? Natasha? And Natasha, afterwards. Oh, okay. Hi. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Good day, everybody. <laughs> it's Natasha Piri here from SABC News. Um, Uh, not points of orders, but whenever you, you, you try to hold them accountable in Parliament, your your motions are always shut down by the ANC. What more will the DA do? You've also um, alluded to the fact that um, you would be writing uh, to Mr. Kachalia of NACAC. If, if your requests fall on deaf ears, what then happens? Will you be threatening legal action? You've, been, you've given, given them two weeks, I think, um, to respond to your requests. If they fall on deaf ears, what then happens? Thank you. Thank you, Natasha Piri. Over to Natasha Marion at the back. Thank you. Uh, it's Natasha from the Financial Mail. Um, I've just got two questions, uh, one perhaps for Leon. Um, to what extent does the, the legislation on professionalizing the public service, to what extent does it address this problem? Because I have a sense after looking at it that it doesn't go far enough. Um, and my next question is, perhaps for uh, Sivue or John, um, and it's a different matter, if you don't mind. Um, the, has the president responded? Can you um, now make public the president's response to your BRICS um, application, the application on, on the BRICS matter? Thank you. Thank you, colleagues. Any other hands? Okay, I'll hand over to John. Do you want to come in as well on the what we can keep doing? Okay, cool. Thanks, uh, Natasha. Um, Natasha one. Um, yeah, I think that. Yeah, Natasha one point oh to two point <laughs> oh. Um, thank you very very much uh, for the question. Well, what do you do? You got to keep going, and you know I think that a lot of what we had done was vindicated in the Zondo Commission report, particularly when he asked why did you vote against the uh, establishment of an, of an inquisitorial inquiry into Eskom? Why did you keep? voting against it. So I think there, there are eventually um, ways to do it. But the thing is, we're not going to fix it until we fundamentally reform parliament. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, I'm sorry to say, that we do not have a parliament in South Africa at the moment. It doesn't meet the constitutional requirement for what a parliament should be. And I go beyond the bricks and mortar. We've been without a parliamentary building for almost a year and a half. Uh, there's no public access to the the committee and its workings. The, there's no public gallery for the public to come and observe parliament. And there is no opportunity, particularly for those people who don't have data, to log in and watch their parliament. So parliament is already now falling foul of its constitutional obligations to conduct its affairs openly, transparently, and in public. So we've got a toy parliament that exists at the moment. And so we can expand a little bit more on that. But it has consequences. Uh, when you have a parliament that's not effectively functioning. We sit in a small room, like a glorified district council, with very little ability to be able to do the work that a parliament should be doing. The, uh, the presiding officer spoke about this wonderful training that's been rolled out to MPs. We've got some MPs who still can't master Zoom. I don't know how, what, where this training has been or, or what it has done, but it's certainly not reflected in the work uh, of Parliament. But you keep going. And we have put already a number of times some documents on the table from lapdog to watchdog. Sevier has put forward a number of, of suggestions in the various committees about how we can strengthen Parliament. And here's the thing. No Democrat or person committed to freedom and democracy should be scared of a well-functioning parliament because it literally is the heartbeat of keeping a multi-party democracy alive. And those people who don't want it to work, I believe, have an ulterior motive. They don't want it to work because they don't want the oversight, the scrutiny. They don't want well-resourced and equipped members of parliament who are able to do their work effectively because it means that the chances of them being caught out and found out 
are so fundamentally um, more Im important. So, yeah, it does fall on deaf ears sometimes, but you've got to keep going. And I believe that the answer lies in building a new majority in parliament next year. Then we can really enact the reforms that are long overdue. Over the course of the last 25 years, the ANC has systematically pulled the teeth out of parliament. They removed interpolations. They removed questions without notice. They removed the ability of members of parliament to have their work and private members' bills prioritised over the legislation of the executive and have completely defenestrated parliament. I believe that a new majority in parliament with a new speaker, with new presiding officers can re-inject life into parliament, which is why it makes the Moonshot Pact even more important um, for, for next year. Um, I cannot give you any further information. My uh, attorneys are not even allowed to share the response with me as the uh, person who drafted, uh, who signed off the papers. Um, we are, through our legal team, making representations to the judge that the, we believe that the public interest overrides the confidentiality that is required. And certainly we believe that the aspects that could remain confidential doesn't mean that the entire affidavit should be clouded under confidentiality. Perhaps those parts dealing just with the warrant could be redacted and the rest of, the, of it released. But we've noticed from various statements already that the ANC said that the BRICS summit will be going ahead and it will be going on in South Africa. I sincerely hope that what has been reached is some agreement that Vladimir Putin will not attend. South Africa does not need in this particular difficult time that we find ourselves to compound the strained relationships with some of our major trading partners and economic uh, benefactors in the country, um, given uh, the, 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 and I think it would be terrible for South Africa to have Mr. Putin come here to this country and not execute the warrant again. I think it would be the final nail in the coffin for things like AGOA, I think it would fundamentally end up towards start, starting some form of either direct or indirect sanctions of South Africa. And that's the last thing our floundering economy needs right now. We need every little bit of help that we can get. So let's not score own goals by doing silly things that end up costing a great deal for no real game change for South Africa going forward. Thanks. Leon, you want to and so. Uh, I think I think John has mostly covered the the issue around uh, what more can you do. I think for me, I think one of the key things is is for South Africans to understand that the work of Parliament is actually the work on their behalf, and that the institution <coughs> belongs not to politicians but to them. And so I think that's then when you start to realise that issues of public record are important. And so this is why, I mean, the ANC would often ask, why do you bring matters to the floor of Parliament for a vote when you know you're going to lose the vote? So that it can be a matter of public record, either for future court cases, but more importantly for South Africans to see how their members of Parliament are voting. I mean, recently, even uh, t uh, the former president, Tabombegi, wrote a scathing letter to the, fo to the deputy president, uh, Paul Mashadile, asking him why it is that the ANC voted against uh, an ad hoc committee to, to investigate ESCOM corruption. But these things are important. And so even when you don't have the numbers, you have to push people who don't want parliament to work so that they can make those decisions that are reflected on the record. And of of course, where we are able to approach the courts where parliament is failing, we will do that. Where we are able to push for legislation as we are doing with the coalition stabilization bills, we will do that. And I think it's important to not give up because you don't necessarily have the numbers. Because also those things will form the record of what you will use to be able to essentially transform and um, and and rebuild parliament uh, after after 2024, and we're really really hoping that uh, you know voters can start to see that there has been a complete antagonistic approach to the way in which parliament works, because a working parliament is certainly not in the interests of the ANC currently. Uh, thanks, Natasha, for the question on um, the public service bills that have been introduced. Um, there are three of them currently before the committee or on its way. 
I think the first thing to say is that uh, some of these bills, especially the public service amendment bill, is a direct response to the DA's work on cater deployment. The DA submitted the end cater deployment bill about two years ago and it went through the parliamentary process. At that stage, we got various civil society organizations to back what we said in that bill. The court cases clearly are ruffling the ANC's feathers. And so they have gotten to a point where I think they want to try and make it look like they are doing something about this, including through the framework for the professionalization of the public sector, where the uh, experts involved in that actually made it very clear that cater deployment is something that's unconstitutional and must be addressed. But I think that you are absolutely right that the bills do not go near far enough. They are trying to put a fig leaf uh, or a plaster over this problem rather than fundamentally addressing it. So I want to give a couple of quick examples of how they are actually informed by the DA's work on this issue, which I think is important for the earlier question about why do we keep doing these things? Um, and you sometimes see them coming through in ways that may not be the most high profile, but that do matter. So if we look at the bills that have been introduced now um, in the public, sec uh, public service uh, uh, area. One of the provisions is that directors general and senior managers who report to directors general cannot hold office in political parties. That is a direct outcome of the pressure that we have been applying in this regard. It absolutely does not go far enough, but it shows that in that one particular area, there's a step forward. Another example is that the Public Service Commission will be included as an independent institution in the Public Finance Management Act, another one of those specific elements drawn directly from the DA's NCADA deployment bill. But while there are examples like this where the, the ANC has realized it needs to appear to do something, the overall effect of these bills are not nearly enough. What we need and what the NCADA deployment bill would have done is to actually outlaw the political interference in the appointment process. It needs to be a crime that you go to a selection panel and say to them, listen, forget about who you ranked as the top candidates here. Forget about the CVs. This is the person that we are instructing you must be appointed to this position of power. That must become illegal in this country. And then we will have the ability to hold those people criminally accountable when they do so. Now, I think it's important to also note the court processes that are unfolding. They are very, very relevant to these bills. The first aspect is our victory in the High Court on the PIA application to actually obtain these records. If you go and look at the judgment there, the judge is absolutely clear that you cannot formulate a proper response and a proper way to end cater deployment if you don't know exactly how it operates. And it says clearly there that I, as a member of parliament and a member of that committee, have a constitutional right to see how cater deployment works, because that is the only way you can craft informed legislation. At the moment, we can't do that because we don't have the complete picture of what it is that we are responding to. So that is another reason why that case matters. Secondly, obviously, is the case where we are seeking to declare the practice unconstitutional. Now, that moment is going to be very important because if we win that case, we are going straight back to Parliament on these particular bills that have been introduced and we are saying you cannot in any rational, in any rational way suggest that you are fixing the public sector and the appointment processes if you are not going to implement what the court has said, namely that this practice is unconstitutional. And we must end up then whether it is in this term, and that's what we will continue to push for in, in, in opposition, or frankly, in the next term. And the new government, the new configuration in parliament that is going to follow when the ANC loses its majority, to make sure that these bills are actually refined to tackle the root of the problem, which is the political interference in appointments, and to actually make sure we make it a criminal offense for cater deployment to take place, and that is how we are going to finally start firewalling that separation between party and state. It's, an, it's a principle as old as democracy itself, that you have your political office bearers who make policy and you have your officials who implement policy. 
the two are not the same and it's time to separate them and make sure we build a professional and capable state. Thank you. Thank you very much to our leaders. We have two more questions from journalists watching on our live stream. The first question is addressed to Werner Horn. How will the DA go about getting the Scopians 2.0 set up? And the second question is addressed to Siviwe. How will the DA address the issue of the ANC abusing its majority in Parliament? Your responses in that order, please. Thanks, Charity. Um, yes, uh, Scorpions 2.0 and specifically uh, Scorpions in a format that will uh, prevent future political manipulation and abolishment when uh, the, uh, the, the entity performs its job too well for the liking of corrupt politicians will depend on, as we indicated, firstly, a constitutional amendment to uh, insert the Anti-Corruption Commission um, in Chapter 9, along with other Chapter 9 institutions like the Public Protector and the Human Rights Commission. And as we indicated, we also strongly believe that um, in that amendment, the Anti-Corruption Commission must already be identified and characterized as key to the uh, maintenance of the rule of law in South Africa, which would then require that any future attempts to abolish it would need a 75% a support in, in, in Parliament. But of course, none of the Chapter 9 institutions operate just on the basis of the Constitution. So the second private members bill we are in the process of finalising is the empowering legislation. Um, at this stage, the the uh, content of that draft bill makes it clear that uh, the Anti-Corruption Commission must firstly deal with what we could call grand-scale corruption, the type of corruption that ultimately um, causes uh, either a, a section of society or large parts of society to be denied uh, certain basic rights. So that would mean the type of corruption that ultimately siphons off the, the public purse to the extent that service delivery cannot happen any longer. Um, and, and the empowering legislation also, uh, importantly, at this stage we're looking in terms of the security of tenure to ensure that the, both the, the, uh, the head of the commission as well as uh, the ordinary members be appointed for a period uh, more or less around 10 years, so that their independence be protected. And lastly, we're looking into including certain provisions around a, a fixed percentage of the national budget as a non-negotiable portion of funding, so that the uh, Anti-Corruption Commission is not subjected to the whims of the party in government when budgets are being appropriated or apportioned, but will always have the assurance that it will be uh, well resourced. So that, that's the basic, basic thrust, again, uh, uh, informing both the draft constitutional amendment and the empowering legislation. Thank you. Um, I think the question is quite similar to the first one that was asked by Natasha, but I just think um, it's important to just... Uh, also emphasize that none of these things or these parliamentary um, reforms are designed to simply, you know, target the ANC. I think it's very, very important that when you insulate the institution from this kind of interference and abuse, that you are doing it for whoever is in government and whoever enjoys the majority of the numbers. And so what we will be doing is we will continue to legislate to make sure that we are pushing bills that are going to essentially be a 
direct response to the needs of South Africans. We're going to be making sure that we can change the rules where it is possible. We're also going to be making sure that we are insulating the the the, the institution for, from political abuse. But I think one of the big opportunities that's coming for us is two things. Number one is the legacy report that the, the Sith Parliament has to put together. It's going to be important that we really put in some of the things that have really gone wrong in this term. The fact that Parliament's legislative agenda has been paper, paper thin. The fact that repeatedly private members are effectively blocked from uh, introducing their own pieces of legislation. And all of these things have to form part of the seventh parliament because it is in our view that we are likely going to see a change in the formation of parliament and its numbers. And so when that does happen, then we need to be able to refer to a good set of, um, of lessons learned during this time so that we can make sure that we... We, we reform parliament, but not as a target of the ANC, but to reform parliament so it can better serve South Africans. Thank you. If I, could just, if I could just add to that, because I think there is another important aspect to that. And that's also the delay in reforming the state security apparatus of the country. I think we've been very, very um, aware of how the state security apparatus in the past has been abused to fight both internal ANC battles... Uh, against various factions, but also to fight battles against other political opponents. And some of the revelations from the Mufamadi report, for instance, have not been dealt with sufficiently. The allegations made that political parties were set up using state uh, security agency funds, etc. But also as we get into this heightened season now, uh, where very clearly there's now contestation between the president and the deputy president, and I've no doubt that the Saudi revelations and the Imbalula revelations are matters that have come from internal shots that have been fired across different factional bowels within the ANC. So one of the other works that Parliament's going to have to focus on is to make sure that the state security apparatus is also independent and is not being abused for party political funds and is, uh, for purposes, but is being used to protect the national interest of all South Africans, not of any particular political party, but of all South Africans, and to never be abused again in the face of the type of factionalism that we've seen playing out both internally and externally uh, within the ANC. Thanks. Thank you, colleagues. That brings us to the end of our press briefing here today. Thank you for making time to come and engage personally with our leadership. Um, maybe also thank you to all the media houses that joined us through our live stream and all the residents. Thank you so much. Thank you. In this election, only the registered have the power. If you're tired of load shedding, register to vote. If you're tired of corruption, register to vote. If you're tired of the rising cost of living, register to vote. And if you're tired of a government that's continuously working against you, register to vote. Go to check.da.org.za and let's give power to the register. watching like and follow our page on facebook follow us on instagram and twitter subscribe to our youtube channel and hit that notification bell tell us what you think in the comment section and please like and share our videos with your friends and family join the da join the fight to save south africa